dad, if, if you could go back and, and change anything, what would you do? And I think he said a lot of things, but one of the most profound things for me was he said, I would have stopped waiting for man's permission to go do what God put in my heart. That, that hit me so hard because I think when I step back and look at my own life, I'm going, what has God put in my heart? And who am I waiting for permission from? <laughs> and why am I not going after these things? And why am I not redeeming the time myself? And why am I not prioritizing the things that I really care about in my life? And that one statement from my father of, I would have stopped waiting for man's permission to go after things God put in my heart. That's all I needed. I mean, after his death, there's so many things that that propelled me into to just make the decisions to start going after the things that God put in my heart. And, and just back to the family dynamic and the business dynamic, that's where you start prioritizing all of the values in your life. It's crazy to me, Alejandro, that we spend the most prime years of our lives trying to build something as entrepreneurs and business people at the expense of our families and relationships. Yo, 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 Holy Hustle here with my boy, Cody Williams. How are you, man? Great, bro. I'm so excited to be with you. Is that, uh, is that tea or coffee? This is coffee. Can I just, you might think I have problems, or maybe I'm about to share the best hack ever with yeah, you. Can absolutely. I just be honest? Okay, so I love coffee. I like the taste yeah. of coffee. I like the flavor of coffee. In my right hand is a coffee. In my mm. left hand is a Celsius. Mm. Celsius, uh, they their their caffeine gets me going more. Really, but I love coffee, so this is decaf, so I can have the flavor. But this is what keeps me focused and going. I feel like um, maybe Celsius should be sponsoring this podcast. But yeah, bro, like you know, I'm probably you know gonna blur that out because we do not we do not sponsor we don't we do not unless we're getting paid. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That would be kind of cool, though. I had a Celsius for the first time like a month ago. It's actually really good. One thing I heard about decaf recently, like a few days ago, actually, mm -hmm. was that it actually has a little caffeine still. Oh, Is does that it? True? I don't Allegedly. know. I just, I just know that I love coffee, and I just, mm. I didn't want to be an imposter on on this podcast, and just, I, I need people to know that I'm kind of like double fisted here. So, I love it. I love it, man. That's that's awesome. Well, bro, uh, we've been we've been buds for man. I would say it's almost coming up on ten years, <clears throat> yeah. and the thing that I I think I've resonated most with you was every time um, since we've connected, you have kind of been what I feel like I've I've been very similar to me. You've always had one foot in business and one foot in ministry. Um, a lot of people, for those entrepreneurs that maybe don't understand this, maybe the church folks do, but um, they would call that bivocational. Right. And, um, and <clears throat> you know, it's funny. I'm from Sacramento, Jesus Culture, where you currently are on staff over there. I remember leaving Sacramento in 2012. You coming, I think, in 2012, 2013? Mm-hmm. 2013. And, um, and I, I remember leaving, and people would ask me, like, would you ever move back? Like, after your wife graduates, would you ever move back? I said, the only way I told my wife this, the only way I'd ever move back is if uh, Jesus Culture actually called me to hire me to wow. do all their marketing. And the funny thing is, I think in 2013, 2014, you called me. I remember I was at a lake and you called me like, hey, what do you think about coming out? And it just was kind of crazy. It was like, man, I actually lied to myself before that because you kind of like, hey, man, come work, do what I'm doing hustle and, 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 and come do some ministry, man. And it was so tempting. The good news is, you know, several years later, we've had the chance to, um, to work with Jesus culture, work with you guys and your team. Yeah, yeah. You guys are top notch. Um, for those that listen to the music, the, the people are even better. And, um, and so Cody is, 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 is driving a lot of really cool stuff over there. So I want to kind of jump right into the, the story. Let's do it of how you got into ministry and then, and then really kind of actually crush it as a real estate um, investor and a real estate agent as well. So can you kind of talk about how you became bi bivocational? Absolutely, man. I got to just say real quick though, man, you just gave quite the shout out to Jesus culture and the, and the relationship. Um, you have been extremely helpful to Jesus culture, even in the last year. Um, 
getting us in just a healthy place of communication and, and, and getting our message out there in a better way. Um, you've been huge. You've been pivotal. So, uh, yeah, man, it's been, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, no, it's been great. And it's, it's almost 10 years. It's actually, um, nine years, eight months and 14 days. Wow. Um, since we For met, I, it, it's fine. It's fine. Oh, you don't, oh, oh. you don't, you don't know, <laughs> you don't know our, our friend anniversary, but I do. And it's, it's fine. Um, so it's, it's not a big deal that you don't know it. I'm not offended by that, but, uh, I definitely feel bad. Right um, now. Yeah, it's fine. I have it on my calendar. It's like kind of a national <laughs> holiday in my family. So <laughs> it's just me and your wife. That's the only thing. And sometimes you forget yep. your marriage, yep. and, but you always yeah. will remember. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'll for never sure. forget. Never forget. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, man, it's it's hard to talk about any of kind of my journey without really going back to uh just my teen, my teen years of um having a situation where there was a little bit of uh hard times at home. Father left when I was 13, made some pretty intentional decisions about my faith at that point and get just just keeping connected to the church, keeping connected to my faith. You know when you're when your father leaves and this is the person who's really taught you all the principles and the disciplines and the belief that you that you walk out every day that you're living in, it kind of slaps you in the face to go, well, what what do I believe? And it was this decision I made at 13 with the Lord to just say, God, I want to steward whatever you put in front of me. I want to steward my life. I'm going to stay faithful to your ways. And it was different businessmen and entrepreneurs after I made that decision in my teen years that really identified this entrepreneurial thing in me and, and really helped me see it. So I, I went, I went 1920, man, I went, I hit the ground running as far as just entrepreneurship, uh, was a part of a couple business startups. Uh, I then started a uh, real estate investment company. To be honest, a lot of my drive from 20 to 25 was how do I make as much money as possible and, and provide for my family. And there was one real drive and real focus. And, um, I had a lot of success within some of the business stuff that I did, but I realized very quickly that my motives around what I was doing were going to, were absolutely going to be this like carrot around the track that I never actually catch. It was like, yeah, I wanted to do this and then I wanted to make this and then I hit that and then you want to make this. And so at like 25, 26, I'd always stayed connected to the church, but I realized I was like, man, I don't want my life to be about money. And so I swung all the way to ministry. So I'm like, I'm not a business entrepreneur. I'm a, I'm a pastor. I care about people. I don't care about money. I care about people. So I went from business to people in ministry and uh, let a lot of the business stuff go for a little bit of a season. And then I realized this, oh, now there's something else missing in my life. And um, one of my, one of my closest friends uh, in Vancouver, Washington, um, he he told me, he said, Cody, he said, you're a rare breed of people who, when you're not one foot in business and one foot in ministry, you're not quite wired right. You're like overcharged in one of those areas. Almost like uh, you know, like like when you're when you're not when you're not balanced with that, you're sort of you're not running on all on all cylinders, essentially. And it kind of took me on this journey of discovery, man, where I realized that um there's a pastoral people ministry dynamic that I really, really love. I love the church. Um, I love helping people, but then there's this creative entrepreneurial builder side of me and the most fulfilled and happy place that I've been in my life is when I'm doing both. So I've learned, I've been sitting in that lane now for, um, almost 10 years. And, um, I feel like both get the best of me when I'm doing both. That makes sense. No, that's great. And, and, um, you know, I, I, the funny thing about the church, I've had, um, the privilege working in and around churches for 15 years. And, um, a lot of times the church can take a lot, um, of time, you know, it, it, it just takes time, but also <clears throat> we kind of volunteer that time because we mm-hmm. love it so much and want to make impact because we know that it's not just impact here, but it's, it's impact. It's eternal. Right. Right. Um, how have you been able to navigate? Cause right now you t- t- just tell folks a little bit about what you're doing right now for business 
in in Sacramento. So um, I have a real estate company. There's two two sides of it. There's a client side, uh, the agency side, and then there is uh, the investment side. So um, I've got kind of 50 50 split on that. The client side of what I do, honestly, is it's it's really feels like a ministry to me in the sense that most of that is just word of mouth. People understand my history with real estate and investing, and um, I've really done just about everything you could think of from, you know, lot splits and land development and remodels and rehabs and new construction, and I've I, I've sort of done all of it. So. Um, generally the client side of my business is people that know what I've done, know what I do. And they call me, um, really as a specialist, if you will, to come in and help them with sort of a unique scenario. And then, uh, the investment side, man is, um, I guess, I guess they both keep me busy. (laughs) I don't know what else to say about that. So how are you, how are you navigating wanting to excel, do work, do excellent work on the real estate side? Um, as well as be a good steward of what you're doing at the local church while maintaining, you know, family life. Because I think following anyone that knows you, like knows family is very, very important to you. So how do you navigate and set boundaries with clients, with the church? Man, that's a great question. I, I have five daughters, as you know. Um, I have been married 18 years. I love love, love being a a, a husband and a father. It's absolutely my favorite thing. Um, I'm not somebody that is like dreading coming home. Um, I can't wait to get home. So, so the kid dynamic for me is just something I absolutely love. I would say this, uh, somebody asked me this the other day. I, so, so I guess, I guess I should say this. I have the real estate piece in my life, uh, the client work, the investment side, my role at Jesus Culture, uh, on the executive team there, and uh, director strategy, uh, which we can get more into if you want. Um, and then um, there's two different business startups that I'm also a part of right now. Um, and then uh, there's some kind of a passion project that I've been working on that you and I have talked about, uh, just around the area of like holistic stewardship. And um, uh, so I have about five or six things that are kind of floating right now, and. Somebody actually asked me to coffee the other day and they said, Hey, could, could we meet? I wanted to get your advice on some stuff. And they said, you do so many things and I watch you do a lot of things. I really want to do that myself. How do you do that? And I'd never actually been asked that question. And I, to be honest, I didn't really think about that question until he said it, but my response was very, was very quick. And I just said, Oh, that's, it, it's easy because everything I'm doing across the board I'm using the same skill set or the same gifting. Mm, I'm using the same good. the same muscle, if you will. And so good. I think the significance of that is so many people today um, that we both listen to, like an Alex or Mosey, it's it's like they really blow the trumpet on, like just focus on one thing if you want to be great. And mm. so I constantly was questioning, like, oh my gosh, like am I doing this all wrong? Because I'm really not that stressed. I'm really mm-hmm. not that like, like pulling my hair out. I, I have a full schedule, but, um, that includes my family. Um, but I realized I'm able to do multiple things, not because they're all different, but because I'm using the same, the same giftings in all like of these that. areas. So, so my frame of mind isn't like hard shift where I've got to like turn this on and then turn this on. I'm a very strategic person. Uh, I'm a creative, I'm a builder, um, and, uh, and I love to negotiate. And so that's very much a part of everything that I'm doing across the board. And that's the role that I'll play even within Mm. like a startup. So dude, I don't know, man, I could be completely wrong, but I've been on this, this journey now for probably three or four years where I'm, I'm carrying sort of this workload Mm. and, um, I, I feel there like are seasons, my lane. and I think there are seasons that there are seasons, and I just communicate it with my wife and kids. You know, uh, you know, it's, it's a busy season right now for dad. You know, it's a busy season right now, and and my wife. I've always been over. You know, after the first three years of marriage, I've been pretty. Com- I, I, I communicate after. <laughs> you know, it's like I love before that after, three. You know, after three, <clears throat> people say, "Man, the first year of marriage is tough." Man, it was three years first. I had a, 
have a dad growing up, you know, like I had no clue what to do, man. But one thing you said, you know, you got five daughters, I got two daughters. <clears throat> you ever, you ever have people say this and oh, five daughters, you better have a shotgun. You've heard right, that at least right, once. Right. You know, it's funny. I, I saw that in movies and stuff and I'm, I actually don't have a shotgun. Mm -hmm. um, I actually trust my girls, man. Like, you know, I, I, I feel like I've done, you know, and, and how do you feel about that man raising daughters, bro? Like in, yeah, I don't know, you know, like, it's just like five girls, you know, it's a lot like you should get a gun code, you know, like, how do you and I and I'm asking you this, because I know you do this um, dating my daughters, um, mm -hmm. you have a hashtag, it's a beautiful thing, you love, you love, you know, mentoring them and pastoring them and being their dad. Um, how, why is that so important to you, bro? I love, I love that you're asking me about that. I love talking about being, being a father. I think there's two pieces. It's, it's, it's really interesting because my oldest is 15 and a half. I've got a 14, 12 and a half, nine and five and a half. Mm. And so I've got this 10 year spectrum between five and 15 and about to be six and 16. And, um, somebody told me years ago, stay connected to them Get, learn how to get connection with them while they're young so that when you need it, you already have it. So meaning like teen years come, things are changing, hormones are kicking in, uh, adolescent, all of it. So I started something probably five, six years ago where we, we call it Monday in our family. And every Monday night is a date night with one of the girls and they just rotate. They generally are very aware of when their Monday's coming uh, most of them are making plans, uh, you know, before we get there. Um, but we love these nights. We look forward to them. Everybody understands like Cody's Monday nights are off limits. It's what he does. And we've been doing this for so long that now that my, my 15 she was 10. So, so now that we, when we get in the car and we just talk about life, it's not weird. I'm not trying to build a connection in her more moldable teen years where there's so many voices, you know, in her life. So we talk about, we talk about everything and it's not weird because I'm not trying to pry into something or build a connection that I didn't already have. Um, and uh, it's been fun to see where the Mondays move. Like when they're five, they want to go to the park and get ice cream. You know, when they're 15, they're like, let's, let's go to, you know, the, the, the library and just hang out. Let's go to dinner and just talk. And so I've really, really enjoyed that. But, but, but that's probably one of the biggest things that somebody said to me. And I just said, I, I got to do that. I got to make, make the connection and keep the connection. And then the second thing, man, is celebrate the next. And I think as parents, we love our kids so much. We love the phases that they're coming out of. And we're like, oh, you're so cute. I don't want you to grow. Stop growing. You know, and we, it's like, for our own selfish reasons, we're trying to like somehow press pause on the growth thing. And it's sometimes as parents, we can actually miss the opportunity to celebrate the next with our kids because we're so busy going like, don't grow up on me. And um, so, man, every phase I'm like, can you believe you're going to be 13? Can you believe you're going into high school? Can you believe, you know, um, you know, you're doing this or you're doing that. And it's, can you like with, with my oldest right now, it's like, can you believe that you could drive in six months? Like mm. inside, I'm like, please don't drive in six months, but I'm celebrating <laughs> like the, what could be. So dude, I don't know, man, as parents, I think we're all trying to figure it out, but I think, um, learning to keep that connection and, and start it young has really been, uh, a big component. And they're very aware of what I do within business. They're very aware of what I do in ministry. They love the church. They love the Lord. They love mm. going to church. In fact, they're probably trying to drag me to more weeknight events and, and all sorts of stuff than I'm even trying to go to because uh, they just want to be at the church. They love worship. They love Jesus. They, 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 they have an environment where they have all these adults and mentors that love them and pour into them. And, you know, my girls, they also say things to me like, dad, thank you for working so hard. Mm. Um, thank you for, you know, uh, we see what you do within, you know, business stuff and thank, thank you for working hard. It, it's just, dude, I'm super blessed. I, I don't know what I've done to quite deserve it, but, um, I think communication and all of these things, they just know about all the things that we're doing. It's not like I go to go to work and then come home and they have no grid for what dad does. They're very aware mm. of, of, of who I am and what I'm doing. I love that. That's and a really long I, I, answer, man. I'm sorry. No, it's good. I, I think it's important because <clears throat> I think a lot of entrepreneurs, man, I, I've, I've been around them 
And, um, you know, they're so driven. They're so ambitious um, at, at the detriment of, of family and, right, and right. their kids. And, um, man, it's just a few more years. And then oh, I have all the time in the world. But they haven't put those deposits in like you talked about at those young ages. And I, I just, I just thought that was very encouraging, man. So that was, that was incredible. And I, I just encourage, especially men, you know, man, hang with your kids. Like, you know, you said it's almost like a Sabbath for you, you know, like Monday night, it's off. Everyone knows you communicate it, communicate it to your project managers, your assistants, whatever. There are certain times that are family time. I actually have to, I calendar all that in. I love my that. Calendar. Like, so, so 100%. I know we always, we always, prioritize what's in our calendar. And so, and that's usually all business stuff, but I just started a few years ago, calendaring in Sarah time, girl time, you know, date night and things of that nature. And, and it's a reminder. I get pings. To, oh man. Like, and I love it so much. Speaking of family, because I think family really, um, as entrepreneurs, it, 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 it's so, it's so, a, when I, there's no, um, there's a holistic approach to who we are as a business person. We're not yeah. a business person than a family person. And this, right, it's, right. it's, it's all comes together of how we show up in the world. You mentioned your dad left when you were 13. My dad left when I was three, but there was one photo, man, that I saw of, of you holding your dad's hand at his, at his, uh, on his deathbed. Man, like, was there reconciliation? Like, can you tell a little bit about yeah. that story and how it made you who you are as an entrepreneur today or, or uh, how that's how your faith has played a role in that? Yeah. For sure. I think that my dad, he, well, let me just say this. Um, my dad passed of leukemia um, eight years ago. Um, and he, what was really unique and special was about five years before that, his death, um, he just had an encounter with Jesus that changed his life uh, once again. And so much of the struggle that my dad had was actually things that we all deal with on a day to day with just our identity, our self-esteem, um, how we're seen, how we're received, how, 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 you know, rejection, uh, versus approval. Um, and, uh, I think one of the things that was so profound was the last five years of life, man, that guy was blazing for Jesus. I was just like, he was redeeming the time. It's really how I would say it. And I remember the week that he died, I was asking him questions. Um, Dad, if if you could go back and, and change anything, what would you do? And I think he said a lot of things, but one of the most profound things for me was he said, I would have stopped waiting for man's permission to go do what God put in my heart. That That hit me so hard because I think, when I step back and look at my own life, I'm going, what has God put in my heart? And who am I waiting for permission from? <laughs> and why am I not going after these things? And why am I not redeeming the time myself? And why am I not prioritizing the things that I really care about in my life? And that one statement from my father of, I would have stopped waiting for man's permission to go after things God put in my heart. Um, that's all I needed. I mean, after his death, there's so many things that that propelled me into to just make the decisions to start going after the things that God put in my heart. And, and just back to the family dynamic and the business dynamic, that's where you start prioritizing all of the values in your life. It's crazy to me, Alejandro, that we spend the most prime years of our lives trying to build something as entrepreneurs and business people at the expense of our families and relationships. And I just decided I don't want to be that dad that's like, all of a sudden I'm 55 and I've spent the last 20 years just working my tail off to be successful and to have financially arrived and, and be deemed a, a successful entrepreneur. And then I go to my kids and I'm like, guys, dad made it. I did it. I, I, I built, I built the wealth and, and the business and the freedom and the independence and, 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 and all these things. And they're like, cool. Like I'm 25 and I'm married and have kids and, I'm really happy for you now. I'm glad that you have time, but I don't actually need that much time from you anymore. So I, I don't want the success that I have in business or even ministry for that matter to, to be built upon the sacrifice of my family and my kids and relationship and connection and development. So uh, my kids are a centerpiece of 
you know, the, 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 the flywheel, if you will, of my life. you like, it's, it's, if, if, if I don't have that in play, um, then, then it, I probably should be doing a lot of other things. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's where I start really getting on this kick about stewardship and, and biblical stewardship. Biblical stewardship is not just, um, building a successful business at the expense of everything else around you. Biblical stewardship is stewarding every area of your life, your business, ministry, family, kids, finances, health, like you name it. When I talk about being holistically, uh, a, a steward holistically, I mean, it's, it's in all these arenas of your life. And to be honest, man, I think Christians should be the best stewards on the planet. I mean, we should be seen in the world as people that just have our, our ish together. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we just, yeah. you know, because we understand what biblical stewardship means and we understand what it means to partner with God in this life he's given us to impact the world around us. Um, Come on. So yeah, man, you're getting me fired well, up because, because no, that's, that's uh that's my lane. That's my love language. I love that, man. And I want to get to that. You know, I just, it was, yeah. <clears throat> I think it's really cool, man, that your, your dad, man, he, he was blazing for those last few years. And, and even that shared here, you know, I think that that quote that he said is, is impact is going to impact even beyond his years, which is, which is a very cool, yeah. very redeeming and a very powerful thing. Um, and that just makes me think. So, like, I guess question to you, yeah, right, right now, <clears throat> and we know each other well. And and uh, what are some of the things that you've kind of, I guess, been holding back? And I guess you know uh, are starting to share more um, publicly about this stuff. I'm actually going to put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, I actually, I actually think um, you, you said to me years ago. Uh, when I, what are the, maybe five, six, seven years ago, you said something about Dave Ramsey. Mm -hmm. You said like, I, uh -oh. I want to be the millennials, Dave Ramsey or something like Dave Ramsey sucks. No, you didn't say that. You didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's going to be the thumbnail. Um, no, but, but you, you talked about, about that. And so I, I wonder like, you know, there's things you wanted to go after that you, you maybe were holding back and now you felt you have permission from what your dad had said to you. What are some of those things that are playing out? I know it's stewardship. What are some, how are you navigating that now? Well, I think that statement of I'm stop, start, stop waiting for permission to do for, for man to do what God's put in my heart at some level. If you truly take that statement, just, you know, if you're listening, write that down and then go, what am I not doing that God mm. has put in my heart? And for me, that was really the process was like, what am I not doing? And I realize that there's uh, there's areas in my life that I'm more passionate about, maybe because of my own upbringing and my own struggles. But there's just this idea around stewardship, um, mm. specifically, you know, when you start talking about money management and finance and stuff like that. I'm grateful for the Dave Ramseys of the world. Transparently, but. I just don't <laughs> think that I don't think he's speaking this next generation's language. And I love if you are coming to me and you're in debt and you got a whole bunch of stuff to figure out and you're just struggling, go through his baby steps, go through his content. And it's, it's gonna, it's gonna be so profoundly helpful. It will change your life. But in some regards, my story isn't necessarily that I came from broke, not a lot of money, but I think Dave takes people to a certain point And then he's like, Hey, I'm not going to go any farther in strategies and tactics because I don't, audience. I don't believe that you're ever going to understand this. And so to me, that's where I'm like, no, no, no. There's so many other tools and resources and tactics and strategies that when you understand and have a healthy understanding of them, they will change your life. So, you know, like I, I think they would just say all debt is bad. And I would actually say that I think there's good debt, bad debt. And if you understand that, then it actually helps you make good decisions. So, um, yeah, I have a, I have a, this, this, this secret dream. Um, it feels so stupid mm -hmm. to say, but just to be like a, like a, like a Ramsey 2.0 for the next generation. And, um, I'm grateful for what he's done. So I'm, 
I don't know. Don't send this to him if you're you're angry at me. Um, <laughs> no, here's the thing, though, man. I, I I think there's you know there's a lot of <clears throat> there's got to be someone s- stepping in. You know, John Maxwell, 70, 80 plus books, you know, just getting up there. And and I think there's, you know, we we need some leaders to start stepping up um, that are for the next generation. I think theologians, I, I think pastors, yeah, yeah. a lot of them getting older. And that's where I remember one time talking to, to Nate Finocchio and uh, he's like, man, I dress I dress like a clown because I'm going after millennials, you know, and and, and he knows who he is. And he's filling this this gap, and and for millennials, maybe for people not over forty, you know, but but these 23, 24 year olds, um, that's that's predominantly his audience. And so I think for you, you know, having the boldness, I think that that's cool. That comes from your dad, you know, that quote that I think everybody needs to write down and put in front of them and start examining that. That's the homework for this podcast. Absolutely, where you go, man, I, I can step in, I I can step up, you know, you know why why not me type thing. And so what are you doing now um, to start making that happen? Because I think there's some people, Cody, that they have a business, um, maybe a real estate agent. I think of a friend, um, a friend of mine, very successful real estate agent in Dallas area, but he wants to start courses. He Uh wants that leverage. Or maybe there's a pastor or church leader that is part-time at the church and has always wanted to start a side hustle. There's imposter syndrome. There's all these different things that they have. What would you what what would you say to them? And I guess maybe what are you doing so that they can kind yeah. of oh, I'm actually going to try that? Yeah. So um, I have been slowly working probably the last two years, maybe even longer to be honest. At just developing what would that voice and that mm. curriculum, if you will, that content like what would that look like? What would be the most useful, the most valuable? And, um, so I really, uh, in the last few months, I, I, I've processed this with you a little bit, which I really appreciate just your insight and your mind. I love how your mind works, man. I just love the feedback that you bring. You see things in a way that other people don't always see. Um, and, uh, so the clarity for me is really, I, I sort of what I'm calling all of this right now is talents. And, um, I just, uh, it's really a play on the parable of talents, which is really stewardship, but then it's also just this idea of like the modern day, like use of the word, um, like, what are you doing with your talents? And I think, um, one of the most profound things for me, uh, is a story about when banning, this is probably over 10 years ago, uh, banning who, if you don't know who that is, banning is the founder of Jesus culture. He was at a church in Africa. And the president of the country uh, went to this church and then multiple uh, businessmen and women uh, that were very wealthy, successful, went to this church and banning speaking and in between services, he asked the pastor, he's just like, dude, like how in the world do you get the president to go to your church, let alone all of these businessmen and women? And the pastor's response was so profound because he said, oh, well, we didn't. We raised them up here. He's like, that president was a teenager, 12, 13, 14 years old. And we started to realize the gifting on his life, the prophetic words on his life for politics. So we gave him the mentorship and the resource to be successful. Uh, those bit, Same with the businessmen and women. They just were young kids running around the church pews. And, and we just recognized the potential and wanted to resource them to be successful. 99% of people will never preach behind a pulpit. So what are you called to do to impact the world around you? And in the church world, I think that we've really praised the pulpit as almost like the ultimate place of arrival as in ministry. And um, man, I have no no disrespect for, for preachers and, and, and teachers and theologians and people that do preach behind the pulpit. But when the majority of your congregation is not going to, to, to do that, um, how are we resourcing them? How are we encouraging them? How are we challenging them to steward their lives, to steward their talents, to steward their giftings and impact the world around them? So I actually put together like a six week course that B- Banning was so gracious. He just let me pilot uh, this this fall. Um, we just got done last Sunday with the sixth week. I had about 40 people sign up and kind of go through it. Um, and it was so much fun because I got to take all of these things on paper and in my head and in my heart and kind of work through them with a live audience. And um, 
uh, my next plan to just, just, to, just, uh, just to be vulnerable and I guess accountable is, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I want to create, I want to package this in a way that churches could use, um, not just Jesus culture, but, uh, churches across the, across the globe. I want, I want to create a piece of content that points at the next generation and, um, resources them. Um, I think I could probably see a podcast coming out of it as well, just around, um, using your talents outside the four walls of the church. I think there's a lot of different components to that, but that's like, that's my passion project at the moment. That's what I'm thinking about late at night. That's what I'm like journaling about writing stuff down. I've got an Evernote folder. That's just full of random thoughts. Um, when I just see, see, read the scripture or see something or hear a story, I'm just constantly, it's like talents is the thing in the back of my head that. Mm. normally when you have something that's always sitting there, it's like, okay, pay attention to that. Maybe put some energy into it. Right. Like, um, it's something that is the least, uh, it, it is the least, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, of all the things I'm doing, it's, it's the, it's not the monetizing monetization Uh piece. Uh, it's the passion piece. So, you know, I'm still figuring that out, man. But man, um, John Maxwell, I think he said, when an opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. Hmm. And what's fascinating is there's, I love that you said for two or three years, you weren't just like, man, it's a cool idea. Let me just keep wrestling with these ideas and these, but you were journaling, you had Evernote, you were thinking about it, you were stewarding it and you were, you were stirring it up. You were, you were, you know what I mean? And I I think that's a difference between some people that like, they just, man, it's just going to happen one day. And you're going to get in front of people, you're going to get into a room and you're just not going to prepare. So that preparation while you're considering doing this down the road, but you're, you know, you've been a good steward of what God has in front of you today, but there's going to be a season that comes where that opportunity is going to come in. And I I think you should have been writing, journaling, thinking, testing, all those different ideas that you have. And uh, you know, God, I think God honors that. I want to turn our, turn our attention real quick to, to the parable of the talents. Yeah. We've heard that. St- I love hearing sermons on this, but if you were going to give a little sermonette, mm-hmm. you know, for a reel <laughs> or an extended reel, <laughs> um, man, what is your take on the parable of the talents? Well, at the, at the core of that for me, and it's, it's my, it's my, it's my heart. It's my goal. It's what keeps priorities in line. It's just that simple phrase. Like my, my goal is to, when I die to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And when you take that statement to heart, when you say, God, that's my heart, that's my goal in my life is that when I get done with my life, because we all have a day that, that, that we're going to be moving on from this world. When we, when we meet our maker what does he say? And, and I want my, my, my heart is to hear him say those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And when you take that statement and you, and you, and you bury it deep in your heart, you keep it on the forefront of your mind, it should prioritize your life, right? It should put you in a healthy perspective of God is creator. He is Lord. He is owner. I am manager. I am steward. That is, that is, that is how this worked. God chose to partner with man to, to fulfill his purpose on the earth. And he, he's choosing to partner with you and I. And so we get this opportunity to look at God, not only as a father, but as a partner and say, um, Lord, I want, I want my life to matter for the right things. So, so that's, that's a big heart for me. And then the second piece there, man, is, um, just, you know, the third servant, uh, he just buried, he just buried the talents because he was so afraid of what his master would say, right? He was so afraid of how his master would respond. And I think for me, you know, I know theologically really, really that, that servant, if you really kind of study the parable is really talking about the unsaved, you know, like giving your life to Jesus. But, but, but there's a perspective within that, that I think about a lot which is really around this idea that am I viewing God in the right way? And and what I mean by that is, am I viewing God as a loving father or am I viewing God as this judgmental, harsh, angry, 
mad at me. You didn't do the right thing. You messed up. You're imperfect. What are you doing? You didn't bring any excellence in that. You did nothing with it. How do I view God as owner and Lord in the area of stewardship? Um, and I think, I think for me, I really, I really try to hit that with people is if we don't have a healthy perspective of our relationship with God as a loving father that is for us, that is not against us, that wants to see us succeed, that wants to see us be productive and fruitful and, and all of these things, if we don't see him as that dad, that's cheering us on in the background, um, uh, we're missing we're missing the opportunity to to really live out a life that is fulfilled in 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 fruitful. I love that. And I and I it's just something that's interesting like I want to be careful here because <clears throat> you know people talk about the prosperity gospel, generosity gospel, purpose gospel, poverty gospel, you know, um, you know, Deuteronomy 8:18, God gives us the power to create wealth. Well, well duh, you know, he owns right, it all, right, you know what I mean? Right, right. So when you think of like you know, I think it's Genesis like one twenty eight, one twenty six around there, where where we're literally like we're created. I remember the author that said it to to build civilizations and culture. Like we are managers yeah. yep. Yep. with him. Um, what are your thoughts on success, making money, killing it? Like, yeah, you know, I, I'm I'm just believing for this. It's going to happen. And and actually, like, what are the benefits of being a manager? Uh, what mm -hmm. are the benefits, like? How does that tangibly relate to success? And I don't know if that's a that's a yeah. hard question to answer. Well, Love your thoughts on that. Yeah. So there's a few things that I think of in, in really no particular order. But um, I would say the first thing that I think about when you say that is the scriptures don't say like money is evil. It's the love of money, right? So we mm -hmm. know that. We've heard that. People say it. And we're like, yeah, da, da, da. I, I get that. I think for me, like – like, stop and think about this. Like, does God really need like your money? Like, does God really need, like, is, is he like just a little shy right now? Like, you know, like eternity and heaven is going through a little bit of an economic downturn. And, you know, like, no, I think that when we understand that, we realize that God uses money to reveal our hearts. Mm. And I think when you start talking about all this conversation around money and stewardship and finances, da, 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 really, it's a indication of our heart. He's trying to get our heart to the right place. And so if you want to see where somebody's at in their heart, just bring money into the conversation, into the picture, and, and, and you'll know everything you need to know about where they're at, you know, in this area. The other thing that is, is annoying to me, could I just kind of <laughs> vent for a second, yeah. is like Christians should be the best managers in the world. They should be the best stewards in the world. Are we taking a chapstick break? Can I, can <laughs> Let's, <I> just, yeah. <laughs> nice. I'm glad we could do no, that, that together. It's our second, second sponsor. Yeah, uh, there we go. There we go. That's funny. I was just talking to my wife about this last night. A lot of Christians operate in this, this, this stewardship manager mindset. They operate in a way that's like, I'm just waiting to win the lottery. Mm. Like that's like, I'm just like, you know, and everything is like, everything is God, everything. And you're like, well, what about stewardship? Like, what about managing? Mm. Like what's in front of you? What about, you know, picking up the talents God's given you and, and really using those. And, you know, I, I talk to people a lot and I just had somebody this last week kind of interact with me and, um, I, I'm not going to say any names, but what, what, what had happened was I was dealing with a very difficult scenario in a real estate transaction. I got a phone call um, from an appraiser that was like, Hey, I can't pass this, this appraisal because there's these, like all these issues that need to be handled. And he called me on a Friday. Well, I've been doing this long enough. I've been in the business long enough to go, okay, have you submitted the appraisal yet? No. So it hasn't had a not passed yet. Right. He's like, no, when are you going to submit it? Monday. Okay. So if I can go handle all of those issues over the weekend and provide proof of that, you could potentially submit an appraisal on Monday that's passed and approved. Right. And he's like, yeah, I could. So dude, I went to work, negotiated with him, got a contractor to come over the next morning, do everything that needed to be done. I had him working on a Saturday. I'm sending photos and phone calls and we're getting on things. 
you know, I probably put four or five hours into making sure this, this problem got solved. And when I called the, the client to tell them, they're like, wow, look what God just did. God mm-hmm. just like did all of that. And, <laughs> and I was like, I was like, yeah, he did. Like he gave us favor and conversations, but you know what he did? He gave me wisdom. So good. He gave me strategy. He gave me ideas and he gave me the ability to, to not just sit on the couch and go, well, hopefully God works it out. I'm just, I don't know. We've got a problem here, guys. I don't know what's going to happen, but hopefully it works itself out by Monday. Like that's, I'm just going to sit here and just hope it works out. No, like God gave us the ability to problem solve to. Mm. So, so did God, was that God? hundred percent. It was God. Did God work through me to solve that problem? hundred percent. He did. And I think a lot of people that they view God as just like this, like lottery that we're hoping to like, just win. I mean, he just gave me the right numbers and I just, I won a billion dollars and I didn't have to do anything. And it's like, no, like the scripture, I don't know what scripture, you know, uh, I, I think of the song defender. I love this song, but you know, the scripture that says he goes before us, he fights mm-hmm. our battles. How do you go before somebody if they're not going? Mm. how do you go before somebody if they're not moving? And I think it's, you know, we hear that analogy all the time, Alejandro, like, you know, how do you steer a car that's not moving? Like you've got to be mobile in your mm. life. And and I think part of managing and being a steward is it, it's so important to understand, like, no, there's a responsibility I have to get up in, 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 in push this down the road, move, take steps of faith, get things in motion um, a lot of people don't ever see what they want to see because they're just not willing to do that. So um, that's my vent. I, I don't know <laughs> where that comes from because, I mean, you look at scripture and I mean, I just think of, you know, Abram, like God told him to go and he, then he would show mm-hmm. the land, you know, and, and I, that's kind of the process, it's almost, it feels like an unfortunate bad manager and leader that God would be, but he wants to see us make moves and take action. Right. And and ultimately it's stepping out in faith and faith isn't waiting. You know, sometimes it's waiting, but faith is an action. I guess I would say faith is a muscle. It's a thing that you do um, versus like the lottery, you know, I'm just going to sit and hope. And so, so yeah, that, that, that's funny. I, I do love the talents. You know, I think of LeBron, I'm going to take my talents down to, to, to Miami, to, to Miami. Yeah. And I think of that talent. Love like that. LeBron might've got like, when it comes to basketball, like a 10 in talents, I probably got like a 0.5. <laughs> and I think people, Cody, if they're, if they're not careful, they end up looking at other people's level of success and talents mm-hmm. and go, man, why didn't God give me that? And why don't I have that? I wasn't in the right family and God did this. And I did that. And, and sometimes even when they're that, maybe not that negative, but they just look at other people's success and going like, man, why don't, but, but again, it's like, what, 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 how would you encourage people to go, man, like, this is what God gave me. And I'm going to, I'm going to, with the 1.5 talent, I have, I'm yeah. going to go change the world with this one thing. So what wisdom or encouragement would you give folks that, that maybe don't, don't feel like they've been gifted with much. They want to be an entrepreneur. Maybe they are, maybe they've struggled for mm-hmm. five years, 10 years. Um, and the economy's shifting. They're scared, they're nervous. And, but, but man, I don't have a lot. What, what encouraging words would you give them, man? Well, I mean, first of all, I would say most of the greatest success stories you hear are from people that battled with that, hmm. um, statistically speaking. So it, it was the struggle that you had to work through so good. to become who you became. And when you're in the struggle, when you're in the tension, when you're, you're seeing the failure, um, it's really, really hard to see the success. But um, but just understand that you're in process. You're in a season. Um, I'm really big on seasons. But for me, I, I think we underestimate the power of being aware of the season that we're in because God created seasons. Seasons are something that when you know the season you're in, you prepare for the season. Mm. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things I would encourage somebody to do is if you're not seeing the growth and the development and the things that you're wanting to see in your life, stop and go, what season am I in? Because if I'm going to go up the mountain to the snow, I don't wear flip flops and a tank top. Like I put on the right gear 
for the season so that I'm prepared for the season I'm walking into. And I think that when you understand the season you're in, it allows you to prepare right and it allows you to ask the right questions and grow in the right ways. Um, so the biggest advice I'd say to anybody that's feeling that is like, you know, first of all, that's the biggest lie of, of the enemy is to tell you that like y- y- the biggest trap of all of this for any, anybody entrepreneurs and is, is the comparison game. Like we understand that. Like that's like, that's the biggest thief of your own skills and giftings. It's just like comparing yourself to other people you have to overcome that. Like you have to move past that. But when you move past that and you feel stuck, that's when using the tool of what season am I in, you embrace and grow and learn the right things when, you, when you're when you willing to do that. It's really a, a posture of humility is really what it is. The other thing that comes to my mind, man, is just this, uh, I don't know if you've heard this analogy, the, 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 you, there's, there's Y seasons and there's T seasons. Have you heard of that analogy? I haven't. So, so a, a T season would be like Jonah. God mm. said, go to Nineveh and Jonah went this way. That's a T. It was like, <laughs> he was trying to do something very, he was, he was being very specific about where he wants mm. you to go. Mm. This is where you go. Jonah went this way. A Y season would be Abraham where it's like, choose your lot, choose your land, go that mm. way, go that way. And I'm going to bless you. And I think that Part of recognizing seasons is also recognizing, am I in a Y or a T season? Is God speaking to me specifically, directly? And it's like, if if I don't go that way, I'm being disobedient. Or am I a season where God's like, hey, Alejandro, I trust you. I've wired Mm. you. I've built you. I've developed you. You want to go left? Go left. You want to go right? Go right. Either way, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to be with you. And I think sometimes we overcomplicate and we get stuck in the middle of this road called life because we're like, I don't know what to do, you know? And I'm like, well, God's just like, hey, like I've given you the power of free will and to manage and to partner up on this. And, you know, I'm going to bless you whichever way you're going. And um, that's been something that's been extremely helpful for my own life because I'm constantly how, asking myself. How do you discern that though? Because like, like you know, I, I can imagine someone listening like, yeah, but like I'm in one right now. I don't. How do you discern what's your go-to method to figure that out? Well, I think there's, this is where I try to be careful because I think a lot of people, pastors will try to create a very specific framework and be like, this is the formula. (laughs) And it's like, I I think everyone's journey is a little bit different, but I do think there's principles that we can follow um, that will get us there. You know, first of all, I think um, leaning into the Holy Spirit and prayer and devotion and fasting. So, you know, if, if you're confused about a season you're in, quiet yourself and spend time with him. And um, somebody, somebody showed this to me the other day. I've actually never done this, but they, they would like two way journal with God, like, God, I'm confused about this. And I, I'm praying about this. And then they would sit and they'd wait and they'd try to hear what they felt God saying. And then they'd Mm. write what they felt God was saying. I thought I was, I've never heard of that before, to be honest, like that, but, though. but I, I was like, that's a, an example of just quieting yourself and leaning into the Holy Spirit and saying, God, so what good. are you trying to say? God gave us the Holy Spirit. God, mm. God, God, his last words, Jesus last words before he ascended to the heavens was I'm with you. Okay. So mm. we know he's with us. Yes. Um, so I think lean into that. The, the, the second piece is, um, this is where God designed community. This is where God designed relationships. So if if I'm in a season um, where I'm trying to assess and figure out what's going on, I think you have to put the right people around you that can, in a sense, um, hold you to who they see you as mm. and pray with you and speak truth and life into you. And, and, and I think sometimes we we underestimate the value of community. We value right. under it. We, we underestimate the value of having those relationships in your life. And, um, you know, I'd say if you don't have those in your life, you need to go get those. And that's why, that's why so church good. is so important to me. That's why being in community is so important to me. That's why gathering those people, you know, around are. And then, um, I just say one more component. I feel like so, it's so relevant. I think that being self-aware is one of the greatest attributes and leadership that you could possibly have. Yeah, and 
that's very difficult. I don't know how you become self-aware without the right people in your life to put a mirror in front of you and go, Hey, mm. you may see yourself as this, but this is what you're projecting right now. This is the, this is the fruit of your life right now. This is the, um, these are the, 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 the growth points in a sense that I'm, I'm seeing, but being self-aware is I think one of the greatest hacks of leadership that's, that's out there. People that can become self-aware are almost in, in, in unstoppable because they understand their weaknesses. They understand their strengths. They understand what to double down on. They understand what to get in their life that they don't have. And I think, uh, I think sometimes self-awareness allows us to see how we're in our own way. Ooh. I think, bro, I, 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 here's what I would say about self-awareness. If I, if I can help folks with this, because um, I think it first starts with humility um, and, and you and I've worked with a lot of leaders and, and <laughs> not all of them are, are, are very humble, yeah. even for pastors, yeah. Christian entrepreneurs. Um, a, a mentor became a mentor later in my twenties, my young twenties, I wasn't even, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe just got married, but I was a punk kid, thought I knew everything for mm -hmm. some dumb reason, because I wasn't very smart, didn't have a lot of anything instilled in me, didn't go to school. So I don't know why I thought that had a lot of pride. And so this guy was, was, was wanting to me to work with him in his organization and do sales. And uh, I kept blowing him off, blowing him off. And I don't remember what I said, but I remember what he said to me. And, uh, and I'll never forget this, this, I, I think self-awareness. Yeah, yeah. Let me, let me just finish the story. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So he goes, so, so I said something kind of rude, like this is kind of, I forget this guy. I said something and he said, Alejandro, if your bank account was as big as your head, you would be a millionaire. Dude, it stung so much, but at the <laughs> same time, it revealed talking about yes. self awareness. It yes. revealed a gap and a blind spot in my life. I believe that the only way that you can truly become self aware is by having people in your life. You give them permission. Sometimes you don't. Yeah. That, that they will reveal things about you that aren't, aren't probably pleasant to your ear, but it would, if you allow and you have the humility to allow people to reveal those gaps in your life, you start to, I think it's a muscle. I think self-awareness is a muscle. You'll start yep, to yep, yep. grow in self-awareness. Maybe some people, a few people are born with that, bro. But I think that it's something that you have to humble yourself with and allow people to reveal those gaps. When you said that, man, I was like, yeah, I was so humbled. I was so, I, I knew I was like naked. I was like, yeah, oh my yeah, God, he sees 100%. me for who I truly am. And if you can see yourself for who you truly are, then I think that to me is self-awareness, bro. And I just, I remember how I feel right now. I got goosebumps, bro, because I felt so <laughs> terrible at the time. I, I love that story because it's true. That is absolutely the truth. I think um, my friend Chad Veach uh, recently said, I love, I just love the way he said this. It's, it's, he said, accountability isn't you checking on me. It's me telling on myself. Wow. That's and good. that's why having community and accountability is so significant because you, you know, it's not like, I'm not your babysitter. I'm, I'm here for you, but it's you, it's you having those people in your life that you trust enough to tell on yourself. Oh, it's so good, man. Self-awareness, man. It is, it, it, it's the game, it's, man. it is so much bigger than we talk about in my opinion. It, it, it really is. And I think once you humble yourself to become self-aware, I think, I think it opens up, um, so much learning, so much yeah. growth, so much experience, most importantly, so much wisdom. You know, I, I think it, it's wisdom. Cody, what, what are you in, in the last 10 years of your life, 12 years of your life, what have you grown to be just so proud of yourself that you look at you and like, like where you've come from dad leaving at 13 and, you know, just different things in your life, man. Um, what are you most proud of? I think that, so that's a, um, I love that you asked that question because that question requires a level of self-confidence to, mm. to, to, to answer. And, um, I'm working on this with my kids right now. And so, um, you're kind of calling me on the carpet, but I think the biggest thing that I have learned through imperfect action is, um, my lane I've, mm. I've discovered like 
this is the, there's certain things that when I'm doing, I'm the most fulfilled. I'm the most content. I'm the most happy. Um, I'm the most, uh, helpful. I'm the most mm-hmm. valuable. I'm the most, um, engaged in like there's there's just so many aspects and i think there's kind of a sweet spot that we can find ourselves in in a lot of the times it's again going back to that self-awareness statement is i've worked really hard the last 10 years to be self-aware and Mm. dude i could sit here for 10 minutes and tell you humbling stories just like you shared your story um because it took a lot of those moments for me to go oh 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 like where i thought I'm the man mm. I'm bringing, I'm being valuable. I'm bringing help. I'm got, like the perception could not have been more off in, and I could, I, I was more in the way that I was actually being helpful in situations because I thought um, I wasn't self-aware enough to go, Oh, this, this isn't my lane. So for me, the last 10 years about my life has literally been finding my lane and, and then, doubling down within that lane. And, you know, even all of this talents conversation for me, it's so much about I'm 42. I don't know that this is attached to an age, but just to seasons, everyone's more mature than others and whatnot. But for me, um, the last 10 years, it's been about realizing I have a story to tell. Like now I have things to talk about. Like in my twenties, I'm just trying to like you know, like reiterate what I'm hearing from other great thought leaders and, and preachers or whatever. And I'm, 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 I'm sort of like an echo chamber to that. And now I'm like, Oh, there's things that God's put in my heart. And I have now the, the seasons and the credibility and the lane to go, this is where I'm going to bring the best version of myself. Um, and, uh, that's, that's where I'm trying to live my life, man. I love it. I love it, man. Well, before I ask these last couple of questions, um, how can people connect with you, learn more about the talent stuff that's coming, future podcasts? Like what's the best way to to connect with you, man? Yeah. Um, right now, man, to be honest, the only like platform I'm consistently on is Instagram, which is uh Cody D, Cody dot D dot Williams, I believe. Um and uh all of the talent stuff, it's all in motion. I'm working um getting the 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 brand identity and direction done right now. And so you'll see stuff in the coming months. Um, and then from there, just because you know you're a good friend, um, I'll have the YouTube set up and and I'll have yeah. I'll have all the right stuff in place. But right now, honestly, man, I mean I have Facebook and all that kind of stuff. I'm I'm the most active on Instagram. Very, very cool. Um Okay, if you can travel back in time, you know, to younger self, I don't know if you think of already think of maybe when you're 13 or when you're 20, um, when you were starting out, maybe a time where you're struggling, what advice would you encourage yourself with? I mean, honestly, I think it's so much of what we just got done talking about. Mm. um, Because I do believe, you know, um, I've loved your podcast, man. I loved when you had um, uh, Austin Damon on, I, Mm. I was listening to it because I thought it was Matt Damon, but, um, (laughs) uh, but you know, I think he spoke that word about like, um, just imperfect action and take imperfect action. Don't wait. Um, I think that that's an important piece of my journey and story because it's really made me who I am. I needed to bump around, so to speak. Um, so I would, I would tell my younger self, give yourself the freedom to bump around and discovering mm. like your lane and in the things that you're good at and the things that you're not good at and and all that kind of stuff but i would say put the bumpers in place like put the accountability and the people because i think there's something significant when you're young about trial and error about being okay to fail because at some level people you're like well i don't know my lane like what's my lane and it's like part of that comes from the trial and error of, of, of pursuing things and passions and ideas and dreams and, and stewarding yourself and moving forward on that. But I think, um, so I don't ever want to stop that. Like that's I wouldn't, good. I wouldn't take away the hard parts of my journey because that's what made me work through things. So I wouldn't want to remove that for myself, it, like give myself that kind of advice. Cause I think that's yeah. who, what made me who I am. But I would say, dude, put bumpers in place um, safeguards, accountability, community, put that in place so that you have these sounding boards to actually help you through those. And then the second thing, man, is, is don't be afraid to commit. 
I, I just, I mean, at least for me as a younger, as a younger version of myself, I was so afraid to commit because I was so afraid that once I committed, I would be saying no to a whole bunch of other opportunities. And what really happened was when I wasn't committed, I was bouncing around, not actually growing in anything because I was too afraid that to commit to anything. Commitment is one of the most freeing things in your life. When you commit, then you understand like what room you're in and how to build within that room. So um, some of you are bouncing around as young entrepreneurs and you just need to commit and, and move Come forward. On. So that's what I'd say to my younger self. I love it, man. Um, okay. Before our final question, man, just so grateful for you, man. You're, you're such a great mm-hmm. leader, great pastor. And I think uh, that dream of yours, that's, that's deep in your heart, like a treasure that you got to like a pirate, go get, um, man, I, I think, uh, I think you're going to be, uh, you're going to crush it as that millennials voice for stewardship, their talents, finances, and uh, I'm real excited for all that stuff that you're doing with the the YouTube studio and all that good <laughs> I stuff. That, you're, 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 you're a great friend. I love uh, you inspire me to be a great father. You're a friend. Um, your words mean something. They're not hollow. And uh, mm. I, I, I love I love that you check in on me and you're always making sure I'm doing good. So just just really grateful for you and in your friendship oh man. bro 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 it's a it's insanely mutual i mean you're you're one of uh you're one of the people i look up to i i love how you use your talents mm. i love how you operate them in you're somebody that i look at as somebody that knows their lane and i think you help people um mm. you help more people because you understand that about yourself so and you've got great hair you. so that's always a good thing. <laughs> Thanks, man. I still got this one. I'm like, I love how it. Ed- how do we edit that? What's no, nah, man? Just, just, just let it roll. Just well, bro, what's <laughs> your, what's your definition of holy hustle? My definition of holy hustle, um, would really be, uh, if I were to put it into one phrase, it's, it's that I am hustling on the right things. Mm. That's cause I love the word hustle. I love to hustle, but holy hustles, I'm hustling on the right thing. So what does that mean? It means that I, um, have a healthy understanding of what biblical stewardship actually looks like, that this life is not my own. And I get to partner with the creator of the universe and I get to manage what he's put in front of me. Um, and, uh, and I get to hustle within that, that, that context. Um, holy hustle means that I'm clear on vision, that I understand the right priorities in my life so that I'm not hustling on the wrong things that I'm not, um, just out there hustling for the sake of hustling, but it's like, I've got a vision. Um, I'm partnering up with, with the creator of the world. And I'm like, let's go do this. Man. I couldn't have said it better. I love hearing these because it just, it, um, I, you know, it's, it's, it gives context for people that are watching as entrepreneurs, as Christian entrepreneurs, but it, man, every time I hear it, it just breathes. I love it because it breathes life into what I'm trying to build for people, bro. I love you so much. You Super too, man. Grateful for you. And I, I can't, can't wait, wait to, to see all that you to, do. I'm honored to be a part of the early stages of what you're building. Thank um, you, bro. it's Thank massive. So it's massive. You are the best kept secret in the biz as mm. far as I'm concerned. So thank oh. you for letting me be a part, love you, bro. I appreciate it. Well, Hey, if you enjoyed this, uh, give it a like review, share it with a friend, watch it again. And uh, we appreciate you. If you want to join the email newsletter, go to holyhustle.com and uh, send out a weekly newsletter, giving you tips, tactics to really turn your God-given gifts and greatness into um, a wildly successful business. All right, guys. See you later. Peace.